Apple Vision Pro, will it make you depressed or can it help you live a richer, more connected life? The answer, surprisingly, is yes to both. The exact answer depends on who you are. This is Hiroki. He hasn't left his room for five years. He lives with his mother and brother at a tiny apartment in the Edogawa ward of Tokyo. He has two pairs of pants, four shirts, and one pair of shoes. The dirt from the last time he stepped outside is still stuck to the soles of those shoes. Every day, he plays computer games until midnight. Hiroki is a hikikomori. Translated from Japanese, hikikomori means the one who pulls back. Pulls back from society, from life, from loved ones. Of course, the modern internet with its online games and other immersive technologies hasn't really caused the hikikomori phenomenon, but it certainly made it easier for people who are predisposed to this type of behavior to really withdraw and just get sucked in into this online environment. And there are indicators that the upcoming wave of VR devices such as Apple Vision Pro could actually make it worse. And it's not just the Japanese hikikomori who are at risk here. Regular people like you and I might actually prefer the virtual experiences to real ones. Social scientists have been thinking about the impact of VR on behavior since the early 90s, but they didn't really have the access to truly immersive VR devices such as the Apple Vision Pro or its analogs. And only now we're starting to see the potential social changes that this technology could create. As it turns out, Virtual experiences have a profound impact on our mental state. Over the past 25 years, research has shown that our brains respond to the VR experiences as if they were real, even when we know that they're not. This is called psychological realism. VR experiences actually produce physiological and neurological changes in the brain in response to stimuli. For example, a research from 2016 showed that cutting off a virtual arm actually led to structural changes in the connections in the brain. And that's just one of many studies that showed how VR changes us. Companies like Apple, Meta, and everyone else who's developing really sophisticated virtual reality headsets, they've done a lot of usability studies to fine-tune the mechanics of their products and the interactions within them. So it's really delightful. But there is a bit of a problem with their research. They assume that their users don't have any underlying mental health conditions, that they don't come from vulnerable populations. Basically, they assume that everyone is normal. And that's not what the reality actually is. Look at me. At first glance, you would probably assume that I'm a fairly unremarkable person. Well, at least from a mental health perspective. But between roughly 2017 and 2020, I was depressed. And things really took a turn for the worse in 2020. But that was before COVID. When the COVID lockdown started, something really changed for me. Forced social isolation actually made it easier to handle my depressive symptoms. Or at least it felt that way. It sort of became addicting. I distinctly remember how fun and easy it was to just sit at home without any pressure to socialize, without co-workers, without friends, etc. If I wanted to have a chat with them, I could just jump on a call. Being away from all those social interactions actually gave me a lot of energy back. It was blissful, I would say. And I thought that I found peace. In the end of the day, things have ended quite well for me. I moved from Singapore to Canada, changed the environment quite radically, and overall my depressive symptoms kind of subsided. But you know, reflecting on those experiences sort of makes me wonder what would have happened to me if I had access to this hyper-immersive technology that Apple Vision Pro is promising to its users. Would it make my symptoms better or worse? I don't know. Based on this personal experience, I think the biggest risk of VR is in how well it creates a compelling alternative to this mundane reality that we all kind of exist in. And things get really freaky if we combine immersive VR with immersive AI chatbots that are recently started to sprout up all over the place. And that mimic the human behavior incredibly well. I feel like it could give so many people a complete escape from reality. And what's interesting here is that psychologists have actually identified three stages of so-called reality escapes. They are relational, emotional, and spiritual. What the social scientists observed when they were studying hikikomori is that those stages are actually progressive. First, people withdraw and start to spend the majority of their time talking to people online 
instead of in real life. They can still have lasting friendships, but all of those social interactions are conducted almost exclusively via the internet. The next stage is the emotional escape. And what this means is that those online friendships actually become stronger and richer, deeper than any in-person friendships. And the final stage called the spiritual escape is where the person completely shuts out the real world. It basically does not exist. Everything happens online. When we talk about people choosing virtual relationships, either with, you know, virtual friends or completely AI-generated personalities, it may seem a little far-fetched, but the truth of the matter is that it's actually a well-documented behavior. Several years ago, a Japanese man married Hatsune Miku, which is a very well-known, completely computer-generated virtual character. This behavior is called fictosexuality or sexual attraction to virtual characters. And it's not just the creepy dudes who engage in this type of behavior. The cut reported that women are interested in companionship from virtual lovers just as much as men. I have never been more in love with anyone in my entire life, says a 36-year-old mother of two who lives in the Bronx, where she runs a jewelry business. She's had other partners and even has a long-distance boyfriend, but says these relationships pale in comparison to what she has with her virtual lover. Now, I'm not against this kind of relationships. In fact, it's important to remember that people who turn to such kinds of romantic interactions online have had some sort of relational trauma and it's their way of dealing with it. But what I'm worried about is that the upcoming VR devices and immersive technologies will actually create such a compelling alternative to real world that it will make it harder for vulnerable people to develop real human connections. And then there is another thing that could make Apple Vision Pro quite dangerous. Common drugs like alcohol, cannabis, or psychedelics change the way we perceive information. And they can actually have interactions with VR. People in the psychedelic research community are actually interested in exploring those interactions. And some even call them cyberdelics. Basically this thermonuclear combination of psychedelics and VR. But despite all of this simmering enthusiasm, we have no idea what the interactions between psychedelics and VR are actually going to be and what consequences they can create for the human mind. And from where I stand, the simplest research question is, does the consumption of common drugs under the influence of VR create a potential for developing long-term mental health problems? And right now we have no answer. Now, Let's imagine the world where devices like Apple Vision Pro are everywhere. It's inevitable that we will see a wave of people who are disproportionately affected by the virtual experiences offered by those devices. People who effectively shut themselves out and prefer those experiences to real life. Recent numbers from Japan suggest that up to 2% of the country's population live as hikikomori in different stages of that condition. If we apply the same statistics to the United States, we're looking at 7 million people. That's 7 million individuals who will withdraw from life quite voluntarily and will subsist on completely virtual relationships. 7 million who would otherwise be able to find a way to cope, but instead chose to withdraw and live in the virtual world because of how easy and compelling it was. It's a little hard to imagine what sort of broad cultural impact that could have. So let me know what you guys think in the comments and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it and subscribing and see you next time.